Once again, it's good to know that we have a God who loves us, as well as a God that we can trust. You know, that brings us to our message this morning in Joshua in chapter 2. If you would turn there, I'm gonna, we're going to read verses 1 through 14, but I'm going to reference the entire chapter of chapter 2. We find the story of the Jericho spies and the scarlet rope, or the scarlet thread, as, as the King James Version puts it. In chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told that the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in thither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they come to be, or for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I wot not, or I know not, as some of your translations may put it. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them in stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came, un, unto, came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt and what, he, what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Gog, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, <clears throat> and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given, a, <clears throat> given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank you that you fulfill the promises that you make. Lord, that there's not a foe that's able to stand against us when we stand upon your word. Lord, we thank you that you've conquered our greatest enemy, the enemy of death, upon the cross of Calvary, and Lord, that You've given us eternal life for all who receive you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, that you will complete that task which you've begun in our lives. Lord, I ask you to lead us and guide us into your word this morning. And Lord, we lift up your name. And we know that your word will not return void. And so Lord, we pray this morning that it would be according to your will. That all things that are done in this place, from the songs that have been sung to the words that are spoken, will bring glory and honor to your name and to your kingdom. Lord, forgive us where we fail you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We find as Joshua begins to initiate a reconnaissance mission, he sends out these two spies, and, and we're going to talk a little more about that. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the mission other than Joshua sending them out privately. The majority of the mission, or the majority of this chapter, actually all of this chapter talks about their encounter with Rahab the harlot. And if you go and you look up this word harlot in the Greek, in the original uh, Hebrew rather, the original Hebrew is translated into pornos. It's the word from which we get pornography or the word pornographic from and so we find that this was a lady of the evening as as uh, through history it, the word has been softened somewhat 
But these men, they go and they enter the city of Jericho. Now, there was something special about Jericho because it was just on the other side of Jordan. It was at, the very, uh, at a very strategic point uh, for the Israelites in regards to their entering into the promised land. And so it was very imperative and important to Joshua that they would be able to go in and to conquer Jericho. And we know that eventually that they will. But we see as these two spies are, are are sent out, I want to point out just a few things to you. First of all, we find the command of Joshua in verse 1. In verse 1, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. This was a, a secret command, and yet when the men uh, uh, arrive into Jericho, word gets back to the king of Jericho that these Israelites have come into the city to spy out the whole land or the, or the city of Jericho. Now, we know that Joshua sent them out secretly. We also know that this was the land of the Canaanites. These were a, a, a very mighty people. They were very mighty people, and, and they were feared by the Israelites. If you remember the story of Moses sending out the 12 spies, all but two of those spies came back and, and told Moses, they informed Moses that it was impossible for them to go in and to conquer the land because there were giants in the land. And the Israelites were as grasshoppers in their sight. So these Canaanites, as well as all of the other people who inhabited the promised land that God had given to the children of Israel, they were feared amongst most of the Israelites. Now, we know the story of how God caused all of that, that generation to die off as they wandered in the wilderness. He told them that not, <clears throat> not one foot, not one soul would tread a print on the ground of the promised land till they had all died off. And so we find Joshua taking Moses' place because not even Moses was allowed to go into the promised land for disobeying God. And instead of sending out 12, Joshua sends out two and he informs them and he instructs them secretly to go into this land of the Canaanites, which once was feared by the children of Israel. But he names Jericho specifically. As I said, the city was strategically located at the pass leading from the Jordan Valley into the land of the Canaanites, ultimately the central highlands, the mountain land. And so it was imperative and important to Joshua for the children of Israel to be able to conquer Jericho first so that they might gain access into the rest of the land. This was the command of, Jer of Joshua. Secondly, we find in these passages the conduct of the spies. The conduct of the spies. Now, obviously, these young men, or these men, they were brave men. They were willing to take whatever matters they could into their own hands based upon their faith, not only in God, but also in Joshua's leadership. They knew that they were going into the land of the enemy, the, the land of opposition, and yet they went anyway. If you notice in verse 1, the last part of that verse, it says these words, and they went. And they went. No doubt the oral tradition, the report of the, the ten other spies that Moses had, had sent out that report had been repeated time and time and time again. And no doubt <clears throat> in my mind that they had also, within that report, had told the story about how God punished them because of their own disobedience and because of their own uh, unwillfulness to follow God's promise and to accept his word. They rejected the idea of going into, into that land. But these men, they, pardon the expression, they bucked up. And they were willing to go based upon Joshua's command, but also upon God's word. We find in the 23rd verse of chapter 6 of Joshua, it speaks of these men as being young men. Young men. 
Now, <clears throat> the thing I want to point out to you in regards to these men being young is that they went into a harlot's house. If you notice the last part of verse 1 once again. And they went and they came into a harlot's house named Rahab and they lodged there. They lodged there. These young men, they went to, pardon the expression, they went to a whorehouse. And yet they remained honorable. They remained honorable men. Many have said that Rahab's, that Rahab's lodging perhaps was on the outside wall of the city. We learned that as, as she uh, allowed a, a means of escape for these two spies, she let down a rope on the outside of the city wall because the city gates were closed at the time that the spies went out. Also, for her, uh, for her business, it would be more advantageous to her to have right there beside the city gates, or at least in close proximity, she could advertise outside of her window for all of those guests who were entering into the city. Now, that may seem rude and crude to you, but it's a fact, it's a fact that where she lived was very convenient to travelers who would be coming through the region and through the area. And yet, and some commentators would say that there perhaps was a sexual innuendo, innuendo for these young men going to this harlot's house. And yet we don't find anywhere these young men taking advantage of this lady's vocation. As a matter of fact, we find quite the contrary. That this woman responding in faith, she hid these spies and was willing to take <clears throat> upon herself these honorable, honorable men's lives at the stake of hers. We find also that these young men who were honorable were also honest. As we look towards the end of the chapter, more particularly in verse 24. And I told you we were going to skip through the chapter, but if you look in verse 24, I want you to notice the report that they came back and they were willing to give to Joshua. It says, chapter 2, verse 24, And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Let me tell you what kind of report these young men gave. They gave a God report, first, of, first and foremost. They said, truly, the Lord, that is God, has given us all of this land. They didn't do like the other two, ten spies who had been sent out from Moses and come back and give a negative report. And even though God had promised to, that they had owned the land, that he was giving them the land, all they had to do in going, was go in and possess it. Those ten said, no, uh -uh, there's no way that we can make it where God is sending us. There's no way that what God is saying is true. But these men didn't look at it from that angle. Instead, they looked at it from an angle that God is doing what he promised he will do. My friend, let me tell you something today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't have your name written down in the Lamb's book of life, if you don't have eternal life because of your faith in God, or if you do not believe what God's Word says. Or if you have some doubt as to whether God will do what He says He'll do, let this be an example to you. As we jump over to chapter 6, now don't turn over there. We'll get there eventually. We find God fulfilling His Word in the children of Israel's eyes and through their hands and through their feet. Truly, God gave them that land. He gave them Jericho. These young men recognized that it would be the Lord who would fulfill his word. Because what God says, 
he will see through. Secondly, they gave a good report. They gave a godly report, and they gave a good report. They told Joshua, said, all of these people who are in the land, they're already afraid of us. Now, the fact of the matter is this, as we read verses 8 through 14 in Joshua in chapter 2, Rahab begins to lay it all out before these two spies, how it had been told them how God had delivered them from Egypt. It had been told them how God had dried up the Red Sea that they might cross over. It had been told them how they had conquered those people with whom they had come into contact with and how they had taken their land, how they had uh, killed these kings. And folks, let me tell you something. Because it, Rahab informs these two young men who had come to spy out the land that everyone in the land of Canaan was afraid. Because, get this, Rahab says, your God, your Lord, is the God of heaven and the God of earth. No doubt in the conversation that Joshua has with these young men. Joshua is willing to go forward on not only their report, but on God's word. God has already gone before them and he's already minimalized the enemy's potential. But these young men, they come and they give a godly report and they give a good report Not only that, we find the command of Joshua, the conduct of the spies, we also find the covenant with Rahab. Now, Rahab makes a very risky move. She lies to the king's men. She hid the spies. Perhaps upon her own Peril, it could have cost her her life, not only her life, but also her father's life, her mother's life, and her brother's life, and her sister's life. It could have cost them everything that they had. But Rahab is willing to take that risk. Now, let me tell you this real quickly. Nowhere in the Bible does it condone lying. And that's exactly what Rahab did. She lied on behalf of the spies for the children of Israel. She lied to her own king, to her own people. But by grace, Rahab responds in faith to the Lord and to his word. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews in chapter 11, what we consider the Hebrews of faith chapter, in verse 31, the writer of Hebrews refers to the faith of the harlot Rahab. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, and when she had received the spies when, with peace. By faith. She didn't die with all of those people who didn't believe that the God of the Israelites was the God of heaven and the God of earth. And she was peaceful towards the people of God. Not only did she hide them, but she would also lie to the king's men and she would detour them away from the men. The Bible tells us that she would take these two men and she would take them up to the rooftop of her house and she would overlay them or cover them in stalks of flax. So that perhaps even if the king's men came in to search her residence, that they would not 
find these men so that no one looking down from their rooftops would be able to see these men on the top of, on the top of Rahab's house. She instructs the king's men to go out quickly. For these men have left, and if you flee after them, if you chase after them, perhaps you'll catch them. But then she gives the spies instructions for their deliverance. After the king's men go out and the gate shut that night on the city of Jericho, she begins to instruct the spies for the nation of Israel on how to escape without being detected. And we find that she lowers down a rope out of the window of her house on the city wall of Jericho and she allows the spies to escape down that rope. In return, now, let me tell you something, folks. That rope was a symbol of salvation. It saved the spies from detection and destruction. But it would also serve as a symbol for salvation for Rahab and all of her kinsmen. For she would take a scarlet thread or a scarlet rope, and she would hang it in her window so that when the children of Israel overran Jericho, they would see that scarlet rope. And by the way, what color is scarlet? Red. What color is blood? Red. The color of sacrifice and forgiveness and grace. And so in Rahab's window, when the Israelites would enter into the city of Jericho in chapter 6, they would look up and they would see that picture of grace and sacrifice. You might say to some degree, in regards to the New Testament church, that rope represented the cross. And the mercy for which God has shown each and every one of us. Rahab responds in faith. Now, look with me in verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, verse 9, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when he came out of Egypt, what he did unto the two kings, the Amorites, that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion, and Og, whom he utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will show kindness in my father's house and give me a true token. And that ye will save alive my father, my mother, my brethren, my sisters, and all that, that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered, our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be... When the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. There are several things that I want to point out concerning Rahab's profession of faith. First of all, <clears throat> first of all, she acknowledged God's divine providence. She acknowledged that God had given possession of the land of Canaan to the children of Israel. She recognized that it was inevitable that God would fulfill his word and his promise concerning the children of Israel and the Canaanite land. Secondly, she acknowledged God's presence in Israel's exodus. Exodus. 
They had heard stories. Not only had this story orally been passed down to the children of Israel, but this story of how Pharaoh's soldiers were killed, were drowned in the Red Sea as it came crashing down upon them, their horses and their chariots, and how the children of Israel <coughs> were delivered to the other side. It was passed on throughout all of the land. How he had provided for them and protected them throughout their wanderings in the wilderness. I mean, let's face it. You can't help but know just a little bit of what's going on with your neighbors. And the wilderness was just across the river Jordan from the land of Canaan. We don't know how the king found out about these spies' mission of entering into Jericho. But word got out somehow. Thirdly, Rahab's faith, her response to, of faith, in, she, in these verses, she showed God's sovereignty over the universe. She said, he is the Lord of heaven above. He is the Lord of earth beneath. Isn't that interesting to know that even in our New Testament example of salvation, we must acknowledge God as the God of heaven and the God of earth. The God of salvation. Lastly, in regards to the covenant with Rahab, we find Rahab's deliverance. Verse 14, the men answered Rahab when she says, will you promise? <laughs> Do you promise? And they respond this way, our life for yours. Friend, if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you what he did on your behalf. He gave his life for yours. He took your stripes that you might be healed. He was crucified and shed his blood that you might be forgiven. You see, it was his life for yours. And these men, they didn't die in Rahab's place. But what they did is they made a promise. Based upon Rahab's request. That they would be willing to die. That she might live. What a picture of God's grace and salvation. And I made mention of the fact of Rahab being mentioned in, in uh, Hebrews in chapter 11. In James in chapter 2, I've got this verse up here for you real in James in chapter 2, in verse 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Remember, James is all about uh, exhibiting your faith through your works. He says in verse 25, and I've got this verse up for you, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. You see, Rahab was justified because of her faith. But her faith was put in actions, in action through her works. She had verbally confessed that the Lord God, He is God. The God of heaven and the God of earth. But she had put her profession of faith into action. 
by delivering the, the two spies, by delivering their lives, and by, willing, by being willing to risk her own life on their behalf. I made mention of the fact we find in the passage, not in the verses that we read this morning, but we find a little later on, as the spies begin to explain to Rahab how she, how she might be saved, in verse 18, it says, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst, didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, but, and we will, will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, will be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear." You see, Rahab's deliverance was marked by a scarlet rope. And we find, as I said over in Joshua in chapter 6 and verse 23, that she would be accepted into the nation of Israel. Now, in verse 23, let me read this verse to you. Actually, I'll put it up here on the screen for you. I've got that in my, in my PowerPoint. It says, and the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rehab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all of her children and left them without the camp of Israel. What Joshua chapter 6 verse 23 tells us is that they brought all of Rahab's family, including herself and all of their goods, out, outside of the city of Jericho before they utterly destroyed it. But they left them separated from the children of Israel. What's ironic is that in Matthew, the gospel of Matthew... We find Rahab included in the lineage of Jesus. God used a, because of his grace and his mercy, God used a Canaanite woman to fulfill his promise of a Messiah. By the way, does anybody know who Rahab's descendant was in the lineage of Jesus? How about Boaz? How about Boaz? Matthew Henry says in his commentary, those only are true believers who find in their hearts to venture for God. They take his people for their people and cast in their lot among them. Friend, nowhere in the Bible do we find any solo Christians. But yet we, what we do find is Christians binding and bonding together. This world in which we live doesn't recognize the importance of fellowship. If you're here this morning and you've been out of fellowship with God's people, I want to encourage you to get back in church on a regular basis, to join if necessary. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that is, you've never professed the Lord as the God of heaven and the God of earth, if you've never Confess Jesus Christ is your Lord, accepting His sacrifice on your behalf, recognizing His blood is available and able to cover all of your sins. Realizing that He rose from that dead tomb. You know what that tomb was? It was dead. What is a tomb today? It's the inhabitant, 
inhabiting place of the dead. But just as Rahab recognized the God of Israel as being alive, we recognize Jesus Christ as being alive today as well. That's what God's Word says. And what God says is true. And He means it. The Bible tells us that one of these days, there's going to be a shout and a trumpet blow. And all of those who are dead in Christ, that is, who are dead to sin, are made alive. That we truly will come to realize in eternal life. Now, friends, if you're a Christian here today, you've already realized eternal life to some degree because you have that peace which passes all understanding in your heart. But you have yet to see. You have yet to see the full extent of your salvation and eternal life realized. But one of these days when Jesus comes back to gather his children home, we will all see because we'll be there with the Lord. Paul says, to the church at Thessalonica. Therefore shall we forever be with the Lord. In other words, we will forever be with him. But just as Jesus comes back to rapture, to, to resurrect the saints, to rapture the church, he'll also come back to judge those who are dead in sin. You see, when you're saved, you're dead to sin. When you're not saved, when you don't know Jesus, you're dead in sin. And they will be judged accordingly, not to eternal life, but to eternal condemnation. So I would challenge you this morning, if you've never professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and shown it in your actions, folks. <laughs> By confessing Him before men and by joining a local church and by serving the Lord daily. I want to challenge you to consider the words of the Scripture this morning. And the blood that was shed on your behalf and the grace of God which abounds to all who will call on His name. Asking for forgiveness and repenting of sin and receiving salvation. Rahab the harlot, many would think that, you know, what a vocation for a woman to be in. But Rahab the harlot was able to have all of her sins forgiven. And as I said, the writer of Hebrews, and even James, speaks of the faith of Rahab. Well, Rahab died one time. At one time in history, the body of old Rahab died. But we know based upon the scriptures, because of her faith, she lives today. When you die, will the same be spoken of you? If the Lord tarries, will people be able to proclaim your faith as a testimony unto Him? We're in a moment, we're going to have a time of commitment and dedication to song as our music team comes. Will you respond accordingly? Accordingly. Consider the words of Matthew Henry. The true believers, they take his people for their people. And they cast their lot in amongst them. If you're here today and you don't have a church home, you've been saved. Maybe you need to be baptized. You've yet to be baptized. Maybe you've yet to join a fellowship of a local body of believers. God's speaking to your heart. Will you come? If you need salvation, will you allow Will you come forward and allow me to share more with you about what it means to be a Christian and how you can know you can have eternal life? Let's stand together this morning as we pray.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the example that you've given us in Rahab. Lord, for the faithfulness of the spies, for their willingness, as well as Joshua's willingness to accept you upon your word. Lord, once again, we thank you for Christ, your Son, who died on Calvary's cross on our behalf. For the salvation that's made possible to all who will heed his call. Lord, forgive us where we fail. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.